All right, let's begin. Ooh, uh, that's quite loud. Hi, I'm Doug Cloco. I'm a solution architect with Microsoft. Been with the company for a little over 12 years. My job at Microsoft is to make certain that we properly scope projects for customers and then help them provide a delivery and present at events like this. So by fulfilling this, uh, I wanted to bring uh, some depth experience along because as a solution architect, our focus is usually about the 10,000 foot level for projects and we help uh, design efforts and I've been involved in a lot of Windows 8 projects, but I wanted to make certain that uh, the depth focus is here as well. And so to introduce uh, Carl, who's a PFE, go ahead. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Carl Liberti. I've been uh, PFE for about three years, Microsoft for about seven, and I am the exact opposite of Doug. I see everything from the one-foot level, and I don't get to see the big picture. Uh, but... Uh, uh, we, get to, uh, we get to see some of the implementation details that perhaps uh, some of our solution architects and our consulting folks don't get a chance to see. So hopefully I can bring some of that knowledge to this discourse today, hopefully. If not, it's Doug's fault. Great. Thanks, Carl. You're welcome. Uh, so uh, an additional component is that Carl's the one that you're talking to when something blows up three months after consulting is left. So we want to make certain he's happy. Let's talk about what we're going to discuss today. There are three areas of focus, and we want to make certain you realize this is an interactive discussion. So if you've got questions, feel free to step to a mic and ask them during the session. We're first going to go through some guidance. And this is not you know, pie in the sky. We think this is what should, should go down when you design a Windows 8 solution for VDI. This is practical. Here's what we've found to work. The second is the detailed review of the configuration. So it's the bits and bytes, what do you turn on, what do you turn off, and Carl's going to go into depth there. And then we'll talk in, at a, a much broader level what we do about performance. So there's a lot of performance tools out there, some from Microsoft, some from great third-party vendors. We'll mention those and talk through them. And uh, certainly we'd like to get you more directly involved with those uh, third parties because of their capabilities in that space. So the first question you have to ask is, what are we doing talking about putting Windows 8 in VDI? You know, isn't Windows 8 all about touch? Isn't it all about, you know, there's certain performance enhancements or capability enhancements? Uh, isn't there capabilities around modern apps, uh, AKA what we used to call, uh, what was it again? I can't even remember. <laughs> but, uh, and, and certainly user experience is a big drive. So, why is it that you care about putting Windows 8 in VDI? Well, it comes down to two things for customers. One, they're looking for the added performance that Windows 8 offers over Windows 7. And number two is to provide that environment, that touch environment interface for non-Microsoft products. Uh, you may have heard our, uh, our focus is on devices and services, which doesn't mean we drop software and say, you know, we're no longer a software company. We're very much a software company still. But it, it does realize two things. One, we realize there are products out there that don't have a Microsoft brand on them. And two, we want to make certain you recognize that we're providing products as a service now. And so that means different things in different product categories. So great. We've decided that Windows 8 is going to be part of our, our VDI solution, or maybe even Windows 7 Service Pack 1. Uh, what's the right VDI solution in that space? And just to make certain we're all on the same page, when we talk about session virtualization, that simply means running on top of a terminal services type environment, if that term means more to you than remote desktop services. So this is uh, running on a server 2012 where it's a shared session. Uh, it's interesting there because there's a lot of folks, and Brian Madden is certainly one of them, that promotes that, that, that model for a lot of customers looking at virtual desktop in, space, that, in that space. Uh, there's certainly some advantages to that, and there's also some disadvantages. Uh, in the pooled and personal, those are terms we use. So pooled means I don't have a persistent user state, and personal means I do. And you can, of course, see you know, why it is important to consider one option versus the other. And app compat ends up being a, an, an interesting factor as we, as we discuss this approach. 
So let's talk through some of the key things that I've talked to my customers about that we get into the, into the weeds on, that we get into you know, conversations that are best left into the high level of why is it option A versus option B. So the first is professional versus enterprise. Um, it may be pretty straightforward for you. You may already have the licenses for enterprise, and so it's great. You just move forward. That's what you've got on your physical desktop, so you're moving forward with, with enterprise in that space. But as you look at the differences, and these are just the pullout of the, the key differences between pro and enterprise, there are a few things that you want to identify. And the first is, if you need to use remote app, Windows 8 Pro won't support that. So remote app is publishing the application as an icon on the desktop, but yet it runs uh, remotely from the server. If you're using Zen app or something else, certainly that's not a, not a key, key factor. Uh, if you're looking at re, re, uh, using a remote USB device or, or redirected USB devices, Windows 8 Pro, not an option. The user profile disk, if you're looking at that option inside of how do I store my user state, Windows 8 Pro, not an option. And of course, the virtual, uh, virtual GPU is certainly something that may be of interest for certain workloads in your environment around virtual desktops. Uh, if you want to look at the full detail in, inside of that, uh, there's a, a link here, and the, it'll be available in the deck. So you'll, you'll be able to see all of the different settings, but these are just the ones that are pointed out because they're different. So the key message here is Windows 8 Enterprise is your, is your choice, is your default choice. Now, that's not to say you couldn't make Windows 8 Pro work in some cases, but what we're saying is if these are criteria that you need to measure against your solution, then you want to use enterprise. The next major topic is whether it's 32 or 64 bit. And you know, this is this is something that depending on if you look at the VDI Smackdown material or other content, they all have an opinion based on what Microsoft has said in the past. I'll make it clear, our message is 64 bit. Now, that's not to say it's the only option nor is it the best option for everyone. But taking into consideration those details around what's different between the two, and we'll go into a lot more detail in the specifics, there's no reason not to use 64-bit. And in case that you already are using 64-bit in your physical space, the app compat issue would not, not necessarily be there. You certainly may have situations where you've got a 16-bit app, You've got applications that simply don't run in 64-bit, great. 32 is a fine option. But look at 64 as your default. I'll be available afterwards if you'd like to argue that point. But certainly understand that that's our recommendation today. The next topic is memory allocation. And certainly Microsoft has some advantages or differences from other products. And where those are important, we'll highlight them. But the key difference here is what we're saying is what you should allocate for memory for your virtual desktop should be between one and perhaps as high as four gig, depending on what the, what the use, use environment, uh, the, the, the resource environment is, what the user needs to run the environment. If they're needing more than four gig, certainly we can look at blades or more dedicated RAM. But by setting that range between that one and two, or perhaps one, is th one and three gig range is probably ideal. Now, if you're using VMware, uh, obviously you've got some question marks here about memory over allocation. Uh, this is not a compare contrast of Hyper-V versus VMware. Uh, this is simply, a, as you're looking at memory allocation, here's some ranges to look at. How do you find out what's the sweet spot? The performance assessment tools that are out there will help with that. This is just a baseline. This is a starting point for discussion. What we've done here is we've done a, a very quick back of the envelope. We've installed uh, in two and, both a 32 and a 64 bit to show that there's relatively no difference on the memory footprint. Now, again, what Carl will do here in a bit was, is show you how to get that down, uh, make adjustments, and there is just one key difference from a services perspective for 32-bit versus 64, 
and it's to accommodate the ability to run the 32-bit Windows-on-Windows uh, components. So you, if you look at the services list, there's only one difference between 32 and 64-bit. Why is it that there's more content than on 64? Well, it's all the side-by-sides and all of the other components that are there to accommodate that. So it's about, about two gig in disk space difference, and we'll mention that here in a minute. One of the key challenges that I've seen with customers, small and or large, is that they build out their virtual desktop either in the exact same way that they're building their desktop image for physical machines, uh, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with the approach. However, if you try and capture all that inside of a virtual desktop, you may end up capturing more than you bargained for. So our recommendation is to talk about looking at an optimized disk, and we've, we've got some ranges here that we've found to be beneficial for customers. But keep in mind that your application compatibility story is going to be a factor. So even if you have non-persistent uh, client sessions, if you've got applications that need to be inside of those sessions, that will change the, the amount of disk space, of course. That's very straightforward. However, you want to answer the question, what can be virtualized and what should be virtualized using, of course, AppV or other products to present those applications to those sessions. And that's where things like version 5 of our product for AppV will make a big difference uh, in footprint, but then also uh, certainly uh, other products from other vendors. So it probably be pretty straightforward at this point, right? You know, not a whole lot of new meat and material other than, you know, certainly enterprise, 64-bit is our key target. But let's now talk about the partitioning. So if you take from an OS disk uh, from Microsoft, uh, mount an ISO, start building out a virtual machine, you'll get a lovely little 350 meg partition. And what's that there for? Well, it's there for BitLocker. Well, am I going to BitLocker a virtual desktop? No. So what are ways to get rid of that? Uh, certainly you can go through and write scripts to you know, using disk part to, get, to eliminate that. Uh, but we'd certainly recommend that you look at MDT. So you likely already have a task sequence using either MDT or Config Manager to build a Windows 7, Windows 8 image. Simply build a separate one so that you can generate that virtual desktop image quickly. And in that, you'll use the do not create extra partition equals yes option, which, by the way, about two and a half years ago, I asked the product team to add that feature simply because we were having problems in another space and had no idea that, that this would be applicable in this space. But uh, I'm not really certain. I, I like the way uh, that Tim Mintner labeled that. I, I wish he would have shortened it, but <laughs> that's, the, that's the rule that you need to use to not have that partition created. And so you get a nice, clean partition and you're not replicating around 350 megabytes of content that is not terribly interesting to you that you will never use. So again, as I mentioned earlier, here are the key uh, number differences between 30 and 2 and 64 bit. And that 2.2 gig, as I mentioned, is side-by-side -side content to allow you to run the 64 bit or the 32 bit uh, uh, run times. So you have to ask, is that a big enough factor to decide whether or not I should be using 32 or 64? I would contend that if you're using non-persistent, then it is not an issue. If you're using persistent or, or personal desktops, it may be an issue. And it depends on a number of factors, such as SAN performance, SAN storage size, and we can work through those details if you want to chat about that offline. Virtual processors, this number seems to be all over the board. I've, I've got a lot of customers that are just using a single virtual processor. Um, certainly with, with Hyper-V, with FairShare, uh, you get the advantage of not having any one particular client machine dominating uh, the use of, of that CPU. So you know, certainly a plug for Hyper-V. However, we recognize that our competitors have other products that, that address that similar capability, and so look at that as well. But, but, but again, the one, two, four model is certainly what I've seen with the customers I've worked with. So we want to talk briefly about what is DirectX 
and remote FX, how does all that fit together? And why is it interesting to talk about that in, in this space? So what remote FX is, is simply a technology discussion around several key components. The virtual GPU is one of them. The USB redirection is another. And there are other features like the, um, I can't remember what we call it off the top of my head, but it's basically the, whether or not we show graphics all at once or whether we, 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 we factor them in a given time and bandwidth limitations. So let's talk through what's needed in order to support uh, remote effects. First and foremost, the GPU that you're using must support DirectX 11. So you ask, well, how do I know if that's the case for my GPUs? Uh, there's a Windows Server catalog website on the link that's here. Right now, there are six from NVIDIA that are certified for that uh, and two from Intel. Uh, so you can certainly point uh, to that as a, a starting point to determine if you're embedded or uh, dedicated video cards on your servers will support DirectX. You have to have SLAT support, and so that's uh, in either the extended page tables or nested page tables, depending on the processor library that you're using. You must use the 1.2 um, video driver. Uh, you don't want to go grab the AMD with all of its fancy features and install that inside of that space, that uh, inside of your server. That's, that's going to only cause problems and only cause uh, rendering issues. So you want to stick with the WDDM version 1.2 driver from Microsoft. And of course, you may need to be able to make certain that the, the service is extended to support remote effects. And that's a simple checkbox once all of the other rest, the rest of the components are configured which looks like this. So as you're looking at your Hyper-V server, in this case, you've got the ability to specify the GPU, you see the 1.2 driver, and you simply check the box that says, use the GPU remote FX, and you're done. Now what does this do for you? If you once you start building VDI sessions or, or clients, you're able to see this as an additional option to configure inside of your session. Uh, if you don't have this enabled, that, that certainly, that simply won't be out, out there and available. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the options for GPU on the server. So you can talk about dedicating uh, a, a virtual, I'm sorry, a video card to v, vGPU capacity, or you can use a soft GPU uh, solution. So both of those options are available to you to accommodate what you're looking for in, in the ability to increase the performance of, of CPU, uh, GPU performance. So what does that look like for a traditional client uh, and how many uh, desktop screens they can use? Because it's not just, it used to be, you know, 1024, 768, boom, you're done uh, with one screen. Now we have the ability to support a wide variety of number of screens and re screen resolutions, and you can see about a double in or a, a twice increase over Windows 7 Service Pack 1 to Windows 8. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't seen too many people with a, with a four screen environment running thin client with 1920 by 1280, uh, but uh, 1200, but it, it certainly is technically possible, uh, and I can see where that might be valuable is, is for those customers that are. Uh, in highly interactive environments and need multiple screens uh, for, high, for updates. I just wish we had some hardware that supported the 2560 by uh, 1600 because that's, that sounds like a very interesting resolution myself. So antivirus software. This is a topic that, that becomes um, uh, fairly challenging with security teams that tell you uh, you know, there is no way I'm going to let VDI run in my envir environment unless you have installed the antivirus agent, it's running with the latest updates, and I need intrusion detection on it as well. well the performance impact to that creates a very, very big challenge for the design of a VDI environment, regardless of whether it's Windows 7 or Windows 8. But what has happened in Windows 8 is, is we'll, we'll get into some of the additional advantages and features but what, what you see is there's two distinct options. The first option is to run against the live agent, or run the live agent against the clients. And what you're going to get, <clears throat> excuse me, is about a, a 10 to maybe 12% increase in disk I.O. as a result, depending on 
what, what rules are set, depending on how often you update antivirus material. And you say, well, that's not a big deal, except if you're running 10,000 of those machines in a virtual environment. So we want to be certain that we consider the option and understand what it is to do a pre-scan and then do an exception for the operating system files. In a persistent environment, this is less of a conversation starter for most customers. In a uh, non-persistent environment or pooled environment, this is an easy conversation. If I get a notification about a virus, shut the machine down, bring it back up, I'm done. But in the case of a persistent or pooled environment, I, I, or I'm, I'm sorry, a persistent or, or a dedicated environment, perhaps the antivirus is the right option. You're likely looking at a different sizing and capacity plan for that solution anyway. So certainly the, the performance impacts are listed there. I list the, uh, the session from Bry Forum that, uh, that was presented on this topic where a number of performance assessments were done, a very strong review, and it certainly was strong because it came out with Forefront 2010 as being the leader in that space, but it's, it covers all of the major vendors in, that, in that, that category. So you want to take a look at that. Again, the link is there. I highly recommend it. So great. That at a high level are some of the key decisions what have I missed? What do you have challenges with? What are your questions in that space? We've covered them all? Great. Okay. Certainly be available for questions afterwards on that topic. Let's turn it over to Carl, and he'll talk about some of the detailed configurations that we're going to go through. Okay. All right. Um, so as, as Doug had mentioned, I'm going to dig a little deeper here into the uh, services. I'm not going to read every last, I'm going to throw this apparently. I'm not going to read uh, every last thing that uh, you see, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk specifically around the, uh, the various items that are here. Uh, you'll, for those of you who are astute or have done this with Windows 7, uh, you may notice that uh, we have uh, we're, we are turning off a lot of different services that are listed here. Um, this is not a hard and fast rule. Um, you know, if you have an issue where um, if you have an issue where you have an application or an environment that needs some of these settings, obviously, please leave a service on if you need it. Uh, the one item here uh, that I'll point out, obviously, is branch cache. Um, I don't know how many of you in your environments utilize branch cache on your physical endpoints, uh, but usually your virtual endpoints uh, are going to be in the data center or close to a data center that hosts the data that you would be caching remotely. Um, I'm hesitant to say disable this, um, as I did come across one environment in the past that did actually uh, test using branch cache as they had geo-distributed their uh, VDI environment. Uh, for network reasons, uh, it, was, it was better to have the virtual endpoints closer to the user and connect uh, across the pond, so to speak. Uh, but in general, branch cache gets disabled pretty much uh, across the board, but you may need that. Um, uh, moving on, uh, you notice that I've got a couple of things here. I don't know if any of you have distributed link tracking client uh, services running on your servers. Uh, so for those of you who aren't aware, the distributed link tracking client uh, tracks links to files uh, on NTFS volume. So if you move shortcuts around, uh, it fixes them automatically. One of the things that's maybe a little lesser known, um, if that service is not running on the server, it does not work over the network to that server. Uh, this service was enabled by default on Windows 2000 server, but that was the last server that we have it running by default. Uh, so unless you are turning that on on your servers, this becomes less interesting on the client, uh, and it's a waste of resources. Uh, the other thing, obviously, we've got EFS, uh, encrypted authentication, pro or, uh, I'm sorry, extensible authentication protocol. Again, if you're using EFS on your, on your clients and you want to move that into your virtual environment and uh, you don't mind the perf hit to do that, um, obviously go ahead and do that. Uh, extensible, uh, extensible authentication protocol, 
you know, we're talking about things like NAP 802.1x, right? So if you're doing that in your environment, please don't turn that off. Uh, but if you are, uh, you know, you probably already know that. But if you're not using it, you can go ahead and disable that service as well. Um, fax, function discovery, we, we don't generally have people publishing UPnP stuff from their enterprise desktops across the network. Um, the uh, file history service, this is new to Windows 8. Um, again, I don't know how many of you have researched that in your environment or, or gone down that road to see if that's something you're going to use enterprise-wide. Um, I tend to turn that off. Uh, home group stuff for obvious reasons. Uh, the Microsoft account sign-in assistant, uh, the ubiquitous sign-in with your Microsoft account, if you disable that, uh, users won't be able to sign into that machine or that virtual instance uh, with a Microsoft account, so please know whether or not you want that enabled before you go turn that off. Um, yeah? Uh, on the Microsoft account topic, the, uh, the, the customers that I've worked with have often asked questions such as, you know, is there a way, you know, because if you don't have a Microsoft account, you can't use this, the Microsoft Store. Uh, is there a way to auto-provision that, i.e. through Active Directory, through some sort of a linking? Uh, the short answer is no, not today, uh, but we anticipate that for the future. So the, the secondary question is, well, if I don't have access to the store, does that mean users can't install applications? And the short answer is, again, not necessarily. There's two options. One's considered deep linking, which is not necessarily an option for everyone. And then the second is side loading. So if you're, if you're curious about either of those options, what side loading is is simply, it's usually a PowerShell script that you're able to run um, typically through some sort of deployment solution like Config Manager and allow those applications to be installed. So it may be an option to consider for your VDI space. It's likely something that you know, you've already made a, a corporate decision if you're looking at deploying Windows 8 anyway uh, as to whether or not the account will be available. Yeah, and actually along those lines, uh, some of the things to be aware of when you're optimizing your Windows 8 images, please do not have store apps installed when you sysprep it. They are broken afterwards. Um, please don't. Um, I don't know uh, what the plans are long term for that. Um, I, I can't even comment on it because I don't, I don't know that we've actually made any progress one way or the other on that. I, I like blue as a color, don't you? Uh, blue blue's is a great. Blue's a fun color. Blue's great. We used it a lot in this slide deck. It's really good. Um, the, uh, one of the things that you might see here, the network list service, uh, the default for that service is actually manual. It is also in Windows 7. Um, there are some issues with that from a boot and log on perspective. Um, this is more in the pooled or the non-persistent desktop space. Um, if you have that service set to manual when the machine first starts up, there is the possibility, you're not guaranteed to this, but there is the possibility that the network location awareness service, which determines what kind of network you're attached to, uh, will try to query this particular service and it won't be available because it starts much later in the boot process. Uh, and if that happens, you'll have this nice little delay uh, where you can't log on necessarily. Um, you'll also notice that the service right below it on this list, the offline file service, please, please, please do not disable this service for any reason. And if you're going to disallow offline files, which in most environments you don't want to have the offline files cache in, in a VM, um, you must do this with group policy. You must disallow the use of offline files. There are known issues with disabling this service on Windows 7 and Windows 8. And once the issues occur, it's very hard to get back without rebuilding that machine uh, or that user's profile. Um, sensor monitoring service, obviously consider that. There, there are some things, depending on what you're passing through to the VM, um, that you may need this for, but in general, uh, we'll come across this one and disable it. Um, and obviously, the SNMP trap. Some of these things, if you're, again, if you're using them, you know, this is not a you must do this. But in general, this is most of the time we come across environments where VDI is being used for Windows 8. This, this is the setting set. Uh, the theme service. Um, in Windows 7, if you disable the theme service, you would lose Arrow entirely. 
Uh, in Windows 8, you actually don't lose. The user, the user interface does not change at all, but there are some things that happen behind the scenes that can uh, either increase or lessen the overhead, depending on whether remote FX is enabled. So that's why this is in consider mode. Please don't turn this off if you're going to use remote FX. Um, volume shadow copy, again, we're talking about optimizing uh, potentially for density. Uh, so we want to try to reduce the number of IOPS. We want to reduce the memory usage. We want to reduce anything that consumes CPU time. Um, Windows Defender service. Has anyone ever tried to disable Windows Defender on Windows 8? You'll find that it's nigh impossible. The service will fight you at every turn uh, because the security and the registry on that key belongs to, it actually belongs to system, but even the system by default can't kill this service. It's for your protection. For your protection. But if you're running another antivirus product, uh, Windows Defender can actually be a bit of a detriment. Uh, the only way really to do this in a supportable manner, yes, you can hack the registry and take ownership and give yourself permissions and to say, please don't do that. Um, use group policy to kill that. Um, we ran into this initially when we were going through setting this up for Windows 8, and it took me like three days to figure out how to kill that. It shouldn't have taken me that long. Um, Windows Search, obviously, if you disable that service, the, uh, the search index is not built, so there's a lot less disk overhead on the system running as normal. But when a user does a search from the start screen, uh, there is some disk overhead as Windows starts hitting the disk to uh, enumerate what's there. So it goes back more to the XP style search where there was no index and everything had to be done live. So there's a trade-off. This is running. You have some potentially low level uh, background I.O. going on at regular intervals. If you turn this off, uh, if the user does a lot of searching, it can actually be worse. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, again, knowing your environment. Uh, I'll, I'll probably say that a lot if you talk to me about this. You need to know your environment so that you know what to do. Uh, but uh, for the most part, these are safe. Um, one, one additional point on that. So you saw a lot of those services, the, the default state was manual. And some of them we were dis even were disabled. And so why would we recommend you go in and force, forcibly disable that service? For those that are manual or either manual with a trigger, trigger start, uh, they could start on their own based on some other dependency. So it's certainly recommended that you hit the disable so you're guaranteed that that service will not start. Uh, and then you don't have to worry about why you're getting spikes in, 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 in uh, IOPS in your environment. Agreed. Um, some of the other things that we do uh, recommend, obviously, is configuring the event log to be a minimum size. Um, we've reduced the number of things running. Hopefully, we've reduced the number of eventing, uh, things that are going into the logs. But we want to reduce that. The minimum size is uh, 1028K. Um, we want to try to reduce that uh, event log size. We want to modify the retention policy period. Um, I will talk to you about a script that we have uh, that we can do to automate a lot of this uh, in a second. I'll show it to you. But we're also talking about disabling hard disk timeouts. Uh, again, in a, in a VDI environment with shared storage, uh, IOs may take longer. Uh, we want to try to avoid logging those things to the event log uh, on a regular basis when we kind of know already why the IO is slow. Um, we've disabling uh, some of the NT, like NTFS last access timestamp, try to reduce some of the other uh, background IO and things that happen when NTFS uh, objects are read and written, you can imagine, especially during boot and some of the maintenance periods, there's a lot of disk activity going on. System restore is another one. Uh, we generally find that's not very helpful in a virtual environment. Um, killing hibernation, doing some disk cleanup before you sys prep, uh, some of those things. Um, there's one thing that we do sort of recommend that is somewhat of a security change uh, that some other folks at Microsoft get mad at me for doing. Uh, but in a, for example, in an environment where you don't have a, a remote FX or a, a pass-through GPU, the, uh, the uh, consent on secure desktop for UAC prompting can be a very slow process in the virtual environment. And we recommend that you consider disabling the secure desktop prompting um, because there is actually some really heavy uh, GPU activity that goes on when that happens um, to dim the screen and provide you a view of the secure desktop. Um, again, this you, you may or may not want to do that. Um, 
Well, it I certainly put depends. That, I put that out there because it does have a, a very large benefit yeah. from a performance standpoint, but uh, it is providing that UAC prompt now on the you, you, on you, the shouldn't, have, you shouldn't have UAC prompts in the VDI environment anyway because everybody's running a standard user, right? Right, exactly. This should never go. happen, so it's not a big there deal. There you go. Yeah. Uh, some of the things you may notice that I don't, sorry about that, some of the things you may notice here uh, that I don't have listed, um, obviously we're not disabling UAC, that's not a supported configuration, uh, less secure, I don't want to call it insecure, but it is less secure. Uh, we're not disabling things like ASLR, uh, that's again, uh, some of the uh, virtualization products out there may want you to do that so that they can do memory dedupe, uh, you are reducing the security footprint of the operating system and you're also doing something we don't support or test. Uh, disabling IPv6, uh, yeah. disabling the Windows firewall service. IP helper. All of those things are unsupported, please don't do them. Um, you do not want to be in an unsupported configuration on 20,000 virtual endpoints that, yeah, you don't want to be there. Performance attack. Yeah, don't do that. There's actually not a huge performance benefit for doing any of those things either. Uh, there's a bit of a misconception there. Uh, we do have, again, some of the resources. Some of you may have seen this before. This has been out there for a long time now. Uh, but a gentleman who used to be in MCS uh, uh, wrote this by John Jonathan Bennett, wrote this IO optimizer that's uh, out on autoit.com. Uh, provides a nice UI. Doesn't go very deep. Uh, not up to date for Windows 8. Uh, but it is sort of the starting point for where we moved along, I guess is the right terminology. Um, the, uh, the uh, article here that you can take a look at, we've got this here, uh, which lists that and quite a few other, including uh, non-Microsoft vendor guides, links to documents by Citrix, VMware, um, some of the other vendor guides, some of the uh, documentation internally at Microsoft that we've got up there. So this is a link that will take you to all of those, um, a nice little table with all those things, including a script. Um, this is the Windows 8 version of this. There was a Windows 7 version. I don't know if any of you are aware that this existed. Uh, we gave Jonathan Bennett the credit uh, he deserved for starting this. We did steal some of his code, and I use the word steal loosely because he did give us the okay to do so, but uh, we, uh, we wrote this for Windows 8. Uh, there is a version for Windows 7. Um, you'll notice that this was last updated yesterday. Uh, we, uh, we found a, an issue with the script. Somebody ran it and said, hey, it did something. And, Oops, sorry. So we turned that off. But uh, there, this version is uh, fixed. There are no typos, hopefully. Oh, and comment typos are okay. I, my, my typing skills are very poor. But uh, when you run this script, people are generally concerned with memory footprint, even though CPU and disk I.O. actually end up being usually more important from a day-to-day -day user experience perspective. But everyone likes to look at the memory numbers to see if whatever they did worked. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a screenshot of what a Windows 8 64-bit fully patched machine looked like before and after. Uh, you'll notice that on average the memory use, these are averages. Um, You'll find that a, a VM that sits for a long period of time and doesn't do anything actually drops a little lower than, the, than these numbers here. But on average, you're going to find the before uh, number with uh, actual in-use memory uh, at about uh, 450 megabytes or so. Um, and uh, the, the, the after uh, looking at about 409, 410, the number actually kept doing this, flipping back and forth between 409 and 410. Um, and actually, if you let it sit for longer, uh, it'll drop even further, the, the after. The before will stay about the same. You will notice that this after number here uh, at about 409 megabytes uh, is slightly less than a standard 32-bit Windows 8 installation. Uh, so we've actually gotten below the smaller uh, of the two footprints uh, that stock Windows 8 will give you. Um, but again, we're, we're more concerned about CPU and disk, in all honesty. Uh, every little bit helps. I'm going to get logged into my machine here. I'll show it to you. If you mind hitting that for me, thank you. Oh. That's really pretty. Let's fix that, shall we? I don't know why it's doing that. Now we can put it back. 
kind of ugly, but we'll take it. Oh, okay, did that. Awesome, fantastic. <laughs> Demo Gremlins. Good thing we did the uh, tech check this morning. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'm really glad this worked before, and now it isn't working after the machine went to sleep. Well, let's maybe just go back to. We'll that. just do this. When everything fails, just turn it off and turn it back on. That's the that's the right way to troubleshoot, right, Doug? I, I, I you're the PFE. Okay. Well, that's the <laughs> PFE says that's the that's the right way to do it. Um, let's see if it'll do it now. There's the uh, pretty Bing bears today. I will hit apply. There we go. I will move this over here so you can see. There we go. That's a little easier to see. Yeah, hey, there we go. That's all clap at the poor PFE who's having trouble with the projector. Okay, so as you can see, this thing actually has been, this has been idle all day. Uh, I did this on purpose, started this this morning. Let it run all day. So you can see it actually did drop down quite a bit, uh, down to about 415 megabytes. Obviously, I cannot control uh, what your applications do. Uh, but in general, Windows, it's been sitting like this for a good three or four hours now, so I don't expect it to go down too much further. Um, but what you can see is there's an after here. I actually created an after VM just in case I had more demo gremlins. Uh, this is what it looks like afterwards. After you've run your script. After the script, yeah. And you'll notice that this has dropped down to, give or take, uh, right around 395, 396 megabytes. Uh, and you'll also notice that the cache size is much smaller. Um, we don't want to disable Superfetch. Uh, for those astute among you who may have noticed, Superfetch was not in that list of services on the PowerPoint. Um, in Windows 7, the Superfetch service is not aware of virtualization. In Windows 8, it actually is. Uh, it is aware of virtualization. Um, for any of you also who are astute among you who may have noticed, and I'm going to bring this over here so that I can, where are we? Where's my mouse? There we go. Uh, for those of you who may have also noticed, um, I did not go in and touch things like TCP offloading, uh, receive side scaling, some of those things. Uh, and the reason being, uh, Windows 8 actually manages to figure that out for you as well. Uh, if it determines that the network virtual, the virtual network card that you have in the virtual machine does not support those features, it actually goes ahead and turns those off. Um, I have actually used Windows 8 in customer environments. They're not using Windows 8, but I have used Windows 8 in customer environments to figure out what the right settings should be for those same settings in Windows 7 on that virtual platform, because Windows 8 figures those out. Um, so when I install this into Hyper-V, for example, all of the network offloading gets turned off, because the virtual NIC does not support it on my machine. Um, but I want to show you what happens when you run this script. And if I can find my mouse, I'll do it. There we are. Got captured by one of the VMs. There we go. Let's make that go away. Make this come back. That's really weird. Anybody else find this a little weird that I can't see the day? There we go. Let's see if I can find the close button by clicking about. <laughs> wow, this is this is really awesome. Glad glad we did the tech check, guys. Yeah, I know. It's that's really not a great way to kill a not a great way to kill a virtual machine, but uh, it does work. I'm about to do it, too, if this doesn't work. You're just going to have to live with this really poor display. I can't do it. So here we go. Make it go away. Kill this. I'm going to run this script. I'm going to show it to you as well and uh, do my best to keep it on screen so you can see it. Uh, you'll notice, obviously, this is the version that was updated yesterday. Um, and when we go ahead and take a look through it, um, there's a lot of things in here. We've got a lot of constants. So again, if you want to go ahead, and some of these things are, a lot of those things where I said consider uh, in the slide deck, we've got them uh, broken out here so that you can true or false them. Um, we've also got the ability to install .NET 3, uh, given that it tends to be one of the other challenges that we have in Windows 8 in general with customers and applications that require it. 
Uh, so any way to make the machine a little more useful at build time and not afterwards is a good idea. Um, but um, here's our, our section where we're go ahead, going ahead and doing the service configuration. You also notice that we're touching scheduled tasks on some of these. Uh, there are about 36 scheduled tasks on a Windows 8 machine that we go ahead and recommend you turn off uh, because either the service that's associated with them is disabled or the uh, scheduled task just is not required in a virtual environment. Uh, it does not really do anything outside of a physical environment. Um, here's the disable Windows Defender service section that I told you about. You also notice there are four, count them four, scheduled tasks for Windows Defender. Um, you need to kill those as well because they will still try to run even if you've disabled the service. Um, we're also going ahead and turning off things like hard disk timeouts, turning off hibernation, disabling system restore. Um, if you look through this script, you may notice that there are some calls that use WMI to do things, and they're not direct registry edits, even though they can be registry edited. For example, uh, there's actually a really good one right here at the top. Um, enable RDP connections. Everyone knows that you can turn on uh, F and I TS connections in the registry. Just set that to zero, and RDP works. The only problem is there are known issues with doing that. Uh, we want to try to avoid those. Using WMI to toggle the setting itself actually avoids those issues. I am loath to use the word bug, uh, but we'll call them issues. Um, but there, there are that way on purpose. I don't want anyone to see those and go, why, why did that guy do that? Um, I actually did and then found out that there are bugs. Um, don't tell anybody I did that, even though it'll probably be on the recording here <laughs> across the internet. Um, I'm going to pretend like Doug said that if anybody asks. There you go. It's, here's the other scheduled tasks. that You'll notice that this list can get really long. Um, this actually, again, the, there's a link to this in the deck. Don't feel like you have to try to copy this down as I scroll. Um, but uh, setting the event log size. For anybody who can do that, um, that is a skill that you can market, by the way. Um, but we're doing a lot of things here. Uh, performing a disk cleanup. Um, and then there are actually some user-specific settings, uh, especially around things like uh, IE offline screen composition, turning off some of the screen savers, uh, some of the eye candy, things like that. Uh, those are our recommendations from a general desktop session. But this is what it looks like when the script runs. And uh, I apologize that I'm sort of doing this the hard way here, but I'm going to do it this way anyway. There's my UAC that's not on the secure desktop, by the way. Doug said to do that. It looks good. It does look good. I'm going to let this run. And as you can see, it's flying through. Some of these things, anyway. Hey, look, that value already exists. I have actually run this on this machine before. Here's the disk cleanup. This runs. If this is a new machine, this should run for maybe a minute, hopefully less for the sanity of the folks watching this in the room. So another thing to point out while we're waiting for this to finish up is there's a PowerShell version of the script that we're writing. Uh, and so as soon as that's available, we'll, we'll link it on the same page for yep. you as well. Yeah, we originally wrote this in VBScript uh, a few years ago. Um, most of the administrators that I came across were afraid of PowerShell still at the time, and I wanted them to use this. So I did it in VBScript, and it sort of has lived on in VBScript ever since, even though I should have done this in PowerShell a long time ago. Again, I'm going to blame Doug here. This is definitely going to take a while, so just as I was about to click cancel, I scared it into submission. It's that old mouse move uh, criteria. And you it's move done. The mouse and, it goes, yeah. and, it goes and it's away. done. And again, the, the reason we script this is because we want you to be able to automate it. Um, so I am going to uh, set the screen resolution on this to be really, that's, that's not bad, actually. There's the change here. Okay. It's, wow, this is my demo is just fighting. This worked perfectly fine an hour ago. It is fighting me at every turn here. 
Let's reboot. I want you to see how fast this machine starts up. We have also disabled some of the boot animation. You'll notice there's no spinning circle of Cheerio, of whatever you want to call it. Uh, login's fairly Oof. fast. That was fast. Um, that's, that's it. This is not a solid state drive, by the way. This is a spindle, so that's pretty fast. And if we take a look at performance, you'll notice that it's a little higher uh, as the system normalizes itself. Uh, that number will slowly drop down if we sit here and watch it. Um, but that is the script in a nutshell. Um, there's not a whole lot to it, in all honesty. Um, there we go. But uh, that's it. Obviously, we want to try to automate. Please review the script. Don't just say the guy from Microsoft said to run it and run it in your environment. Uh, and then stuff breaks. And or blame dog. I'm out of business cards, so you won't be able to get one of those from me. But uh, I'm going to hand this back over to Doug to talk a little bit more about some of the performance tools we have to measure, uh, how you should uh, take a look at your virtual environment, how you migrate those settings over. Uh, so I'll leave this back to Doug. Great. Thanks, Carl. Actually, before that, does anybody have any questions? I just realized that I heard somebody talking over here. Is there a mic out there? Yeah. I think there's I think a microphone right there, if you don't mind, just so that people can hear in the recording. Yeah, the uh, question is that script, do you run that and then just prep a machine as part of the image, or for every user it has to run? No, we, we would run that before you sys prep the machine because it does have user specific settings in there so that when you set copy profile to true on the return when you're imaging that back after you've sys prepped it, all of those user settings then get put in the default user profile uh, and then every user gets a copy of those. Um, I, as far as I am aware, we have tested that quite thoroughly. All of those settings should survive a sys prep. Um, will be gone to me if somebody doesn't and finds that something doesn't, but everything that we put in there, at least in all of our testing, does survive sys prep. So. Uh, we would recommend doing that before, along with doing things like doing a full antivirus scan uh, of the machine and, and some of those other things to try to make sure that it's as ready to go as possible. This is just one of those pieces. Anybody else? Yes. Silence means no. There. Oh, that would. Um, you can run a disk defragmenter if. Um, if you so choose, but given it's a virtual environment, that's more of a talk to your SAN vendor about that, whether they recommend that or not. Um, I don't know too many that do, and there's not really a huge performance benefit from doing so. The disk isn't physical, so. Um, well, in Windows 8, there is some optimization that occurs yeah. that we, we didn't actually indicate to turn off. No, but so that disk cleanup script does run those commands to do the optimize. Right. So right. again, a defrag is up to your vendor, really, the, the SAN vendor, as to whether or not they recommend it. I don't know any that do, but no. um, things could change in the future. But right now, I would say no. Because there are different load stages, different things that you have to run the defrag, some of them don't have to do that. No. I, yep. don't know, I don't know what that would. What, so again, there's the, the traditional defrag that you consider when you you know, you've got your physical machine with a, a spinning disk, and that's not something that, that we're talking about here. But then there's also the online defragmentation that occurs, and so that's going to take care of things like fragmented files anyway. It's not something that we recommend shutting off because there are other features that, yep. it, that it accommodates. It's you are disabling the service that would trigger that, but the super fetch piece and all of that is still running. Right. Uh, and that has been tuned for VDI and virtual environments specifically. So leave super fetch running, take that optimized disk service, turn it off, and you won't have that problem. Yep. yep. Good question, though. So let's, Anybody yes, else? go ahead. This script has been tested on Citrix Zen, Hyper-V, and VMware. Yes. Um, there isn't anything in here that would be vendor specific. Uh, and we did that on purpose. Much as we'd love to see you use Hyper-V. Yeah. And I'm sure you would love it too. Yes. And even if you don't, just say you do to make us happy. So let's talk about some of the performance tools that Microsoft provides and our third party vendors provide to uh, help us in this quest to optimize our VDI environment. So the first inside the Windows ADK, which uh, is certainly uh, perhaps not new to you, but this feature or capability inside of it might be new to you, is the performance recorder. 
And then there's the, also the uh, performance assessment view. So we'll look at both of those. What do they do? What's the value of them? If you're familiar with the old XPerf, uh, this is basically just XPerf with GUI. And you've got essentially here uh, the ability to control and configure what settings you want to monitor. So if you want to monitor things like boot time, we're having a slow, slow or long boot time. This is great for both physical and virtual, by the way. Uh, you'll be able to, to specify that for the resource analysis. Uh, hit the start, and it'll perform a reboot for you. It'll then capture that content, and you can go review that uh, with the next tool. But a uh, very quick point out here to, uh, uh, to indicate Jeff, Stoke, uh, Jeff Stokes and his blog on this topic, uh, who wasn't able to be here today, uh, is on XPerf for the layman, a very good resource to help you understand what it does and what it doesn't do in more detail. So, okay, now we've got these event logs, what do we do with them? Well, you know, if you look at this uh, and, and stare at it long enough, you might be able to figure out what's going on. You certainly wouldn't show necessarily all of these counter and, and detail information, but the performance analyzer then is the component that sits to the recorder and says, let's look at this content and see what's going on. So this was a boot time process, and you see a, a huge spike there for the system up front, uh, and then, of course, a, a, a quiesce over time of other, other services that are running. So the general response here is, well, this doesn't really do us anything, any, anything more than just the normal performance counters inside of performance monitor inside of the operating system by, by default. So is this really going to be useful in optimizing our VDI environment? Possibly, but not necessarily. Um, one thing to note, obviously, perfmon samples at one sample across all of the counters per second. Uh, the Windows performance recorder, well, technically the event tracing for Windows subsystem is what we're driving that's built into the operating system, but it traces at about 30,000 events a second, so it's a bit more granular. Um, and we do have the ability to trace mini filter yep. activity in Windows 8 and Server 2012, so we can actually see what's going on from a filter perspective or the, fi the FS filter, uh, filter manager. So. Um, so you, you'll it, use this to, be to solve a problem, yeah. not necessarily to optimize your environment. Correct. The second is the map tool. And map uh, has, uh, over, over generations of, of releases, has brought in and, and uh, removed different components to accommodate. Now, certainly they're great at doing a hardware and software inventory. Uh, there's some performance assessment from a client perspective, but it's, it's fairly limited from the perspective of, well, if I look at my virtual, my, my physical environment today, which machines are good for VDI? That's a hard question to answer, first and foremost, and this tool doesn't really do that for you. Uh, so MAP is a great tool to collect data that you may not already have. It does it all through WMI, so you don't have to install an agent, but not necessarily the best to say, here are the 1,200 people in my organization that are good for VDI, and let's go move them tomorrow. So let's talk about the third-party tools. We list three here. There are certainly more, I imagine. Login VSI is probably by far one of the most predominant and well-understood products, at least from our perspective. What does Login VSI do for us? Login VSI creates, uh, not, not necessarily fake, but generates workloads to help us understand things like peak capacity and also uh, things like, you know, are, are we going to see disk storms inside of my environment. So what I look at Login VSI to do is, once I've created my virtual environment, run it against uh, Login VSI and some of those default workloads, and understand, have I designed it well? Not necessarily optimally, but well. On the other hand, you've got Liquidware and Lakeside, and what they do is they assess the existing environment. So you're deploying a client, you're watching the, those clients over a period of a, a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks, collecting data, and then determining, oh, these, these customers, these users are good for VDI or not. Uh, and so what you look at in those spaces are a large amount of content. They have some great automated reporting that spits out the, here's the target uh, audience that you want to speci that you want to go after for, for VDI, and also does a good job of helping you understand which applications will be virtualization ready, which is uh, not necessarily a nitpick, but if you look at Microsoft's suite of products, we don't have anything that helps you answer the question, is this application good to fit inside of App, App V? Right? We don't have a good, uh, a good rule. We don't have a, a message. We, we have some guidance that says, as long as it doesn't have a driver, as long as it doesn't use a COM or COM plus agent, 
you know, it, it's going to be a good fit. But until you actually go and sequence it, you won't know. Uh, so app DNA and ChangeBase are also good products in that space to help you with that, that assessment. Uh, and, and so we, we, we look at the combination of multiple, multiple tools to help us in that space. If you're using ThinApp, uh, of course, they, they will have uh, reports in that space as well. And so that's what we have for this session. Now, we're happy to, to stick around for additional questions, but I'd like to ask a, a few feedback questions. So first and foremost, who's using VDI and Windows 7 today and planning for Windows 8 uh, in, a, in their space? Okay. Couple over here, couple over there. So it looks like about a third, maybe, maybe 40%. Uh, who is doing that on VMware today and considering Hyper-V? Couple few? Couple. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. We like feeling better about ourselves and our products. Uh, and then last, uh, how many are, are considering using App V5 uh, inside of their VDI environment and looking at targeting that space? More. Great, good, good number of those. Good. Great, those are the, those are the, that's the topics we wanted to make certain we covered. Uh, Adam Carter is here as well, product team representative for VDI. So please feel free to come up and ask us questions uh, at the end. Otherwise, uh, it's beer 30. Thanks for your time.